not come. I'm going to come. All right, everybody. Welcome, Dissidents One and All. This is the first Do Dissidents podcast of 2023. Keaton Weiss here with Russell Dobular, of course. Hello from the past. Hello from the past. Hello, 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 hello. Indeed. You know, the start of the new year means you have high hopes. You really get to wipe the slate clean. You're going to start over again. We think, oh, how great. We have a live stream scheduled for New Year's Day. We're going to start the year off right with a live show. It's going to be great. It's going to be fun. Needless to say, this uh, new year has not started the way we'd have liked because we're not doing this live. We're pre-recording this. And the reason we're pre-recording this is because a certain plague has fallen upon my home. And it has infected my in-laws who live in the uh, apartment downstairs. Uh, and it's affected, infected, I should say, uh, my oldest son, who's one minute are, are older you, than Are my you speaking son. of the virus of unknown origin, Keaton? Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. Um, it affected my oldest son, who's, like I said, one minute older than my youngest son. And uh, so far, knock on wood, I have a lot of wood around me here. Everything is uh, okay. In-laws are a little sick coughing and stuff like that but they've had it for a few days my younger one just tested positive for it this morning but the reason we're doing it even though he seems fine now is that fevers have a way of acting up at night and so in case shit gets real tonight and it's hard to put him down and you know i have to be a dad which is of course my first duty um i thought it would be too risky to schedule a live stream for this evening so that is why we are pre-recording this uh and uh hopefully we will be live again on thursday January 4th. It's important to, to us to be live. No, it'll be January 5th on Thursday, right? Two, three, four, five. That's true. We want to make sure we get one more show in before the January 6th holiday. We want to wish everybody a very happy <laughs> January 6th. We don't want to uh, not have a show before then. So we will be live again uh, on Thursday afternoon. Thank you for bearing with us. We, uh, we, are, we are actually going to do a claymation reenactment of January 6th that night. Yeah, right, exactly. we, we, we've made a little capital diorama in a shoebox. <laughs> yeah. We have little Play-Doh figures we're going to run. It'll, it's going to be a good time. Our own theories. We're going to make a little yeah. Ray Epps claymation thing and say, now he was here at this time. What does it, that mean? It, right. It, and why isn't he in jail? Right. Who exactly. was he working for? Exactly. Exactly. We do want to thank our patrons. Like I said, we are very sorry that we had to do it this way. We do not want to start the year off this way. But we want to thank Elizabeth uh, A. She is uh, our newest patron. So thank you very much for signing up, patrons. We will add another live stream uh, either this week or next week to make sure we get everybody their call-in access that they paid for and very much deserve. You can go to patreon.com front slash to do dissidents to support the show. Also, do dissidents.substack. Dot com. We have big things planned for I, I am also from the past. I am committing to being in the chat in the future. That's right. So, so Russell future will be me hanging is out. in the chat right now. Russell will be hanging out tonight. And, you know, every, if everything goes as planned, so will I. So we'll be responding to chats later this evening. So we will be interacting with you somehow, uh, just not necessarily by voice here. Um but, yeah, we have big things planned for 2023. Our Dissident Film Club is going to be a regular segment. We're also going to start doing regular segments that are exclusive to Substack and Rumble. So please subscribe over there because there are certain things we're not allowed to talk about here on this channel. Uh, some of which, you know, I'm experiencing firsthand right now, if you know what I'm saying. We would like to be able to talk about that since it is the most consequential issue of our time. Uh, it's just really obscene that we're not allowed to talk about the most consequential issue of our lifetimes. Um, but we will be doing that. We just can't do it where we're not allowed to do it. So subscribe to our Rumble channel and subscribe to our Substack, dodissidents.substack.com. Very important. The link will be in the chat. Future me will put that link in the chat. So as you guys are watching it, please click that. But we have some fun stories to get to to start the new year. We are going to make our predictions for what the new year has in store for us. And there was a piece that dropped just before Christmas by Jordan Cheridan 
that has been getting some eyeballs on it. Uh, but before we do any of that, we have a little comedy to start the year, I think. Russell found this one, right-winger that he is, right-wing troll that he is. He found a list of banned words from Stanford University. So, Russell, you want to set this one up for us, and I'll queue up the list itself? Once again, proving that a very large segment, particularly of our academic elites, seem to have taken 1984 not as a cautionary tale, but a roadmap. Uh, Stanford University's IT department, this is particularly coming out of their IT department, has an ongoing Newspeak project. Now, those of you who uh, haven't cracked 1984 since high school, Newspeak was the language that the party developed in Orwell's future dystopia, Oceania, to limit speech and thereby to limit thought. So we see here in this classic description, don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. Now, apparently the folks over at Stanford, and not to pick on them, but many, many, many of their fellow academic elites, um, they, they don't take that as chilling. They take that as a grand idea. And they have this ongoing project to control how people think and what they can think by reconstructing the language. Um, so this, this is... It would be funny if these people did not have the level of cultural power that they have and if they were not going to a university that's going to graduate them into yet more powerful positions. Um, so we want to take a look at uh, some of these gems here. Yeah, so this is an Elimination of Harmful Language Initiative, and they are broken up into different categories. The first category is ableist. We're not going to read every single one because we would be here all day. But they it, say, it, would, you know, it would almost be worth it, but no. It like would we, we, we could do it, a whole show just with each of these. <laughs> we, we probably There's could. not one of them that is not risable. Right, not exactly. One. So the well, the only one I would say is not risable. Apparently, uh, child prostitute. You shouldn't call someone a child prostitute. You should call them an exploited child. That's fair enough because the child's not willingly, you know, a prostitute. Sure, right? sure. Right. Okay. okay. So we'll All give right. him that one. We'll give him that one. We'll give him. Uh, but here's how it works. Okay. So they say instead of using a word like addict, say person with a substance use disorder. And then they give the context. Using uh, person-first language helps not to define people by just one of their characteristics. Don't say basket case, say nervous, because basket case originally referred to one who has lost all four limbs and therefore needed to be carried around in a basket. Interesting. I did not know that, did you? I, I, I actually did know that. Oh, wow. I, I, I knew that because it has long been considered a particularly brutal way to punish somebody among criminal elements yeah i would say i would say that's pretty but, hard. but a true brat basket case you don't just take off the arms and the legs you take out the eyes puncture the eardrums and cut out the tongue all right very good <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that you're welcome Did you're welcome you know? for that for that new year's warmth you there. should submit an edit to them and ask I, them to I, put I, that in there, they saying, hey, you didn't accurately describe what a basket case actually is. Perhaps if you did, people would be more sympathetic to that term on this list. But here's one that I think is great. So you shouldn't call someone OCD. You should call them detail-oriented. And the reason is because uh, OCD is an example of ableist language that trivializes the experience of people living with mental health conditions. Obviously, calling someone OCD does the exact opposite of that. It diagnoses a psychological disorder, right? Obsessive-compulsive disorder is unhealthy. Being detail-oriented is good. You should be detail-oriented. We'd have a better show if Russell and I were more detail-oriented, right? Nothing wrong with being detail-oriented, but OCD sure. obviously takes I, I, it to an unhealthy what... extreme. That's the whole point of it. It's not to trivialize a mental health condition, it's to accurately describe it in the hopes well, that you can treat it. Not only that, they're wrong in that 
to to describe it the way that they're uh, using it, um, that does not describe a lot of behavior that you would apply that to. I understand what they're saying. It they're they're talking about using it where you're not strictly right. Where you're just being something. casual, yeah. But listen, I'll, I will use myself as an example. I have got this very OCD behavior where I've got to look five times before I leave my house. And and sometimes I will, I will, as only children will tend to do, I will mock myself as I'm doing it. I will, I will make it to my front door and then I will come back and look back in my bedroom and go, yep, it's all still there. Yep. Nothing moved. The it's desk funny, didn't go the across the room. Way. When I lived in the city, I was the exact same way. I had to lock my door three times uh, right, very often right, right. because I was afraid my cat was going to escape. That was the thing. I had this, this OCD fear this that my cat, cat was going to run out of the apartment when I was gone. No, it's just like an irrational thing. Something's going to catch on fire. I have a wire too close to a fabric. It's crazy. It's crazy. So when I say, yeah, this is very OCD, saying that's very detail-oriented is not accurate. That's not an accurate description of that behavior. Right. Exactly. That is OCD behavior. That right. is the spectrum of mental health. I am not OCD, but many of us who are not OCD may at moments be OCD or have traits that could be described as OCD traits. I'm not somebody who can't walk down the street without snapping three times and turning my <laughs> right, head. Right, right, right. But that particular behavior is very OCD. Now, what exactly. separates me from somebody with OCD Yes, if I really decided I'm not going to do this, I could stop myself. Right. And right. somebody who really has that diagnosis, they can't. For me, right. I'm like, well, it does, It really doesn't go on for more than a minute. So whatever, man. I mean, I don't feel strongly enough about it. Right. That, that I really care that much. Hey, on but the bright side, you're saying, less likely to burn your apartment down. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That would, that would be ironic if I if if I tripped over a wire doing it and burned yeah, my right, apartment exactly. down. Um, so what they're saying, that doesn't even function as language. That doesn't even function to describe what you're trying to describe when you say something like that. There's a scene in a movie. It's it's a new it's the newest. I think it's the newest uh, Lars von Trier movie called The House That Jack Built, where Matt Dillon plays this like serial killer who who thinks of himself as an artist. It's a metaphor for like destructive artists, right? Like mm -hmm, self-destructive mm -hmm. people, people who destroy right. everything else in the name of creating art. He has OCD, and so it's a super dark movie, but it is funny because he, he he stabs this woman, and he goes to flee the crime scene, and you see in his head he feels like there's a drop of blood on the rug that's going to incriminate him, and so he goes back in and checks on it, and then he comes back out, and he hears the cop siren coming, but he gets back out, and he's like, I have to go back and check again. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure it's not there and he goes back twice while the police are bearing down on the house so yeah, yeah. that's an example of yeah that's me OCD. trying to go to work yeah right yeah. <laughs> yeah that's russell trying to go to work exactly so there are different categories obviously there's ableism ageism colonialism right uh, cultural insensitivity this is a whole section on imprecise language and my favorite entry in the imprecise language is user now don't forget this is an it program so user and they say instead of using the word user, you should use the word clients, right? And their context is, while often associated with one who uses, i.e. software system services, because this is an IT department, it can also negatively be associated with those who suffer from substance abuse issues or those who exploit others for their own gain. So you shouldn't call a user of a software system a user. You should call them a client. So words can no Good longer have more than one meaning. Words no exactly. longer have context. Yeah. It's, you know, I want to I want to bring this guy on. I saw a guy being interviewed on uh, Quillette. They 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 have a magazine. They're expanding into a YouTube channel. Oh, yeah, and I know um, yeah. they interviewed somebody who wrote a very interesting article arguing that the whole woke project is is a make work effort for the PMCs. Because look at all the equity officers who get a job now. Look at all of these academic departments that you open. How many thousands of useless degrees are they handing out teaching this garbage? There, there's a lot of money involved in this in this bullshit. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we will get to that in, in just a moment. Um, but before we, we get too much into the thesis of what this all means, I want to just pull up one more out of the culturally appropriative 
section, Geronimo. Yes. Now, okay. I have a special connection to Geronimo because one of my favorite college memories, and I don't have many great college memories. I think college is a complete scam and waste of time. Uh, and I think this list here is very good evidence of that. <laughs> I think this is really exhibit A I would use in my case here. <laughs> but instead of Geronimo, you know, uh, don't say anything, right? They say, you know, most of these, they give you a substitute. They say none. Mm -hmm. Only use mm -hmm. when discussing the historical figure of Geronimo. Why? Because Geronimo was a famous leader and medicine man whose name is used today as a caricature of the brave warrior, often during macho pursuits. So that's why you should not use the word Geronimo at all. They can't even think of a substitute. Just don't even touch Geronimo. Okay, and that really makes no sense because the way that it's used, look, I could understand, I, I actually could understand why they want to change the names of the Washington Redskins or wouldn't want sports mascots that are like a caricature of Native American culture. I, I, I'm actually, I'm with that. Um, this doesn't make any sense because the way that Geronimo would be used, if I'm understanding what they're saying correctly, and I think I am, is to demonstrate bravery. Geronimo! Right, you jump. So would we consider it an insult if people yelled, Churchill! MacArthur! Right. right. It's, it's demonstrating a respect for the figure. If you look at a lot of these, it's, it's really just, um, I, I do feel part of it is making work for PMCs. Um, I think also it's a way of enforcing cultural superiority by creating jargon so dense and impossible to navigate that it, it serves to distinguish the priestly class from the unwashed deplorables, right? You're not yeah, speaking like well, this. It, yeah. it distinguishes you as lower class. Absolutely. Uh, and in terms of the kind of thinking behind it, one of the things that define psychopaths is their inability to understand metaphor and simile. And this whole thing is full of that kind of thinking. It's psychopathic. It's just, you don't understand context. You don't understand metaphor. You don't understand how saying something in one situation is very different from saying it in another situation. So they, they have a, they have a few things as, as you pointed out, one that, that actually makes some kind of sense. But most of it is asserting cultural superiority, creating jargon to separate the elect from everybody else. They don't really want everyone to speak like this. That, that would make them not special. If everyone started to speak like this, they would up the ante. Exactly. They would come up with, I mean, and this kind of represents upping the ante already. They already pushed it. And now to, it's become too mainstream. They have to push it further. And, and they'll just keep doing this until society snaps and it yeah, becomes I mean, just untenable to behave this way without severe social consequences, which I think is coming. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, this demonstrates the age old concept of the secret knowledge, right? There has to be a secret yes. knowledge that this you is attain. Latin. They're speaking going here. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Because if there's no secret knowledge at these places, then what's their reason to exist? Then the only reason to exist is to basically coerce people into buying into the system so they can buy in, get a piece of paper that says they've bought in. They show that to the person who's interviewing them. Here, here's my slip. See, I bought in. Now I'm here to get what's mine because I bought in. That's all college is, right? right. But that sounds kind of shallow. And so they can't have it present itself that way, right? So there has to be some knowledge that only we as the enlightened privileged uh, few who have the luxury of going to school much less also obviously an elite school like a stanford right they have to have the ultra secret knowledge the super secret knowledge right, of right, words right. that 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 the normies or the people who go to you know filthy you know vanderbilt or you know notre yeah. dame oh, those those <laughs> riffraff or state right? school right or st well yeah oh, state school forget state it. School. <laughs> The they don't know. You don't call someone using your software a user. You call them a client, right? right? Well, then Geronimo. Can... Geronimo. That was, you know, I mentioned there was a kid in college. You know, I went to UMass Amherst for a year and a half in a giant school. So the dorms were very, very tall buildings. There's a six-floor dorm building. I'm walking 
through the, you know, whatever common area. I hear this kid open his window. He pushes a desktop computer, a full console. You know, this was uh, almost 20 years ago. They had the day, these. Yeah. a full console, holds it out the window, just yells, Geronimo, drops it out of a sixth floor window. Doesn't look to make sure no one's walking under him. <laughs> It doesn't, but like, try to be careful. Doesn't issue an actual warning sign. Like, watch out down there. I'm about to drop this. Nope, just opens. Geronimo drops. Could have fucking killed somebody, right? It's good Not thing he hadn't read this. Or nope, yeah, right, exactly. Had if he hadn't warning. read this, he would have just, then I guess the appropriate thing to do would just be to not say anything. Just open anything, the window right. and drop the computer out right. of sixth floor window so with no warning for whatsoever. the students that, that they had Geronimo at that time. <laughs> exactly. Here's one funny one. I know we weren't supposed to read more than this, but this is just a funny one. You shouldn't say Pocahontas. What? Instead, you should say the person's name because this is a slur and should not be used to address an indigenous woman unless that's her actual name. Looks like Donald Trump has made his way into the Stanford handbook of language here because the whole well, that the whole joke of Pocahontas was that that's not gen- that wasn't generally used as a slur before Donald Trump use that for Liz Warren, right? I mean, that's what made it a joke. Well, a lot a lot of these comments, uh, a, a lot of these observations seem to be addressing a, a, a guy from the suburbs in 1957. Like, who, who walks around, who would walk up to a Native American today and call them chief? Yeah, call, right. call, call, call a woman Pocahontas. <laughs> Who's walking around? I mean, other than him going after Elizabeth Warren for a very specific fib that she told. I'm sure Donald Trump even does not walk, just walk up to Native American women and go, hey, Pocahontas over here. Yeah, well, I mean, that you know, who, was the who, whole. Who, who, are, who is this for? Who is right. this for? Who, what? Th- this is a solution in search of a problem. I, I don't think you have a lot of people walking around talking this way to Native American people today. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, so, yeah, that is your language guide to 2023, courtesy of Stanford University. Right. God bless. God, God bless him. God bless him. This, it, I do feel on the bright side, folks, and we're going to get into predictions later. Uh, not this in particular, but little, little little prediction here. This is peaked. It's peaked. Like this is this is that. When you, when they have to go this far to assert their cultural superiority, when they have to get this um, granular. It, how much further can you push it before they themselves don't even understand it? You know what this is? When I fr- when I got my first theater, I read the contract I had inherited from the previous owners who were evil, evil, evil people. And the, the contract was like 30 pages. I was like, what the fuck could be in a 30-page contract for the theater? And I looked through it and wanting to be the benevolent new ruler, right? I cut 20 pages out of that contract. My very first renter showed me why that contract had been 30 pages. Because it is impossible not to violate that contract. That's why it's written that way. Right, right. So that you always have an ace up your sleeve if you need it in a dispute with that person. That's what this is. That's what this is. If you apply these rules, no one can follow them. Which right, means exactly. you can persecute anybody. Right. You're bound to use the word addicted at some point. You're right. bound to use the word user at some point. Right. Right. And 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 then they can go after you as a Nazi. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. Let's move on here. Um, because we had uh, a Substack article come out just before Christmas by Jordan Sheridan over at Status Coup. And the headline here, Progressive Exhaustion, Infighting and a Stalled Movement. Can we reignite the fight? And in this article, Jordan makes a case that, you know, I think was a case that was perhaps worth making in some way, shape, or form a year and a half ago. I mean, this article kind of seems a day late and a dollar short. Um, seems to be fighting yesterday's battle a little bit. But, you know, what he basically uh, wrote this was as a sort of call for unity, uh, a sort of ceasefire amongst progressive media types. And, you know, he describes all of the work that he's done, and he has done very good work at Standing Rock, at Flint, covering the Bernie campaigns, things like that. Um, and he talks about, like he put in the headline there, the sort of exhaustion and hopelessness that has set in amongst many in this 
progressive movement. So I'll just read a little bit from the article, and then I'll read some of his sort of bold type postscript, which is really, I think, you talk about burying the lead. That was really, I think, um, indicative of what he wanted to actually say in the piece itself. But he says, if some or any of these, meaning, you know, what I just mentioned, you know, struggling with the Bernie campaign and Flint's, Right. And all these sort of causes over the years, you know, marching for Medicare for all or the Green New Deal or, you know, know, fight for 15. Uh, If these have left you disappointed and exhausted, he says, disappointed at the stark fall from 2016 to now from a progressive movement that was brimming with a hopeful feeling of possibility of having a shot at changing our corrupt governmental system of producing greater economic, social and racial equality to one fractured, splintered, demoralized, fighting amongst itself, largely disorganized and inactive to a movement where people feel angry, hopeless and cynical, but don't quite know where to place those feelings or what to do with them. I'll tell you what you can do with them. You could subscribe to the Do Dissidents YouTube channel. That's right. Yeah, you can exactly. bring them here. <laughs> yeah, bring them to us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, We're not move- like the others, man. <laughs> We're your friends. Yeah, right, exactly. to a movement where as we've all been guilty of our vital online spaces of independent progressive outlets have descended into an endless circular firing squad with hosts and channels mostly fixated on categorizing who is the real left and canceling those that are the fake or sellout left under the notion that once the so-called imposters are expelled then we can truly fight the oligarchy And he goes on to make the point that the oligarchy are thrilled to see us fighting and canceling each other rather than them. All right. So then when he gets that, you know, and he makes his case here, talks about all these different struggles, the $15 minimum wage, a public option, abandoning $2,000 checks, reasons why we should be disappointed with the squad and with Bernie Sanders and yada, yada, yada. We've heard all this a million times before. He goes on for a very long time. And then he writes at the end, okay, so here's here's the real meat of the piece that he buries in the postscript here. He says, if your reaction to reading this is to immediately open your Twitter, whip up a post, and blast this message, that's fine and dandy. Criticism is always welcome. But before you do, I implore you to pause and ask yourself, why? What purpose is being served constantly being at war with like-minded people? Sure, you might not agree with me or others who uh, consider themselves progressive on all things or strategies, but what true purpose? What is the tangible positive end result that can be achieved by progressives constantly berating each other online to the point where we're fighting each other more than neoliberal corporatists? Your answer may be, well, it's not actually infighting because the people I'm fighting aren't real progressives. If so, I kindly ask you to uh, consider if, for the most part, we were all standing together with two or three years ago with similar policy goals, values, and desires, how can, in your mind, so many you once considered allies now be sellouts or the fake left? Because YouTube hosts like you Say so, because today you like are us. in lockstep. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like me. Me. What do like we do? Like me. What did we do? <laughs> that's a, that's uh, the, yeah, there's, right. Exactly. There's like, there's like that old rehab commercial that used to come on in the middle of the night and scare me high. Where the guy just looked out <laughs> yeah. at the screen and said, what are you, high? You exactly. on drugs? You stoned right now? Exactly. Exactly. I'm not going to read this whole thing because it goes on too long. He says, for argument's sake, let's say you believe it's critically important that we rid the movement of fake progressives and leftists. Let's say you're successful. You've won. They are all canceled and discredited. What then? What then? With the fakes expelled, how will the real progressives left over achieve Medicare for all, Green New Deal, banning fracking, saving the planet, overturning Citizens United, a $30 minimum wage, reviving unions, holding cops uh, accountable, growing mutual aid, protecting the Internet, and more. How do you do that? Okay, so you've kicked out the fakes. Now how do you win these battles? The answer is you don't win these battles. But here's the real answer. Here's the red, red, here's the real red pill that Jordan doesn't want to give you, that most of the YouTube hosts out there, including some of the real left YouTube hosts, don't want to give you, but we'll give it to you because that's how real we are. You're not winning those battles anyway. Those battles are lost. We're not winning Medicare for all in the next 20 years anyway. doesn't matter whether you hold hands with Jordan Sheridan or not, right? doesn't matter whether we, whether we forgive Cenk Uger or not. 
You're not winning Medicare for all. You're not winning a Green New Deal. There's a reason why a presidential campaign was described as a once in a lifetime opportunity. There's a reason why electing Bernie Sanders was once in a lifetime. It was once in a lifetime and it failed and it's over and we're not winning Medicare for all for a very, very long time. And so the bullshit that I think a lot of people have a problem with They might not articulate it this way because everybody's got to hustle. Everybody's got to act like there is a real movement. There is a real strategy. There is no strategy. There's no strategy. There's no nothing. There's no nothing. The rail workers couldn't even get seven paid sick days. You think you're winning Medicare for all, Green New Deal, $30 minimum wage? People don't come to YouTube to be gaslit. They can turn on CNN if they want to be gaslit. They can turn on MSNBC if they want to be gaslit. They come to independent media to find people who are honest with them. And so that's what I'm being right now, honest with you. The major battles of the day are lost, and they're not being won for a very, very long time if they are won at all. You want to win them? You're going to need an actual revolution in this country. And we're not starting a revolution on fucking YouTube, okay? (laughs) It's Google. It's Google, man. We try to start a real revolution on this channel. You know what happens? Some asshole, some Yoel Roth flips a switch, and we're off. So just level with people. I think this is why people have a problem with the people like Jordan Sheridan. It's not that they're too nice to Bernie Sanders or they're too nice to the squad. It's that they're pumping people up to believe in something that is lost. And I think um, you have to be honest with people. You have to level with people. It doesn't mean there aren't battles to fight. We gave Dissident of the Year award to Chris Smalls. Yeah, people can do things. People can band uh, together and rise up and win battles. Um, but they're not going to be these macro wins, these fantasies of a Green New Deal, of universal health care. Those are back to being abstractions now. I'm sorry. If we didn't want to be, if they didn't, we didn't want them to be abstractions, we had to win that 2020 primary and we had to beat Donald Trump. We didn't do that. And so that's it. That's it. What, you want me to bullshit you now for the next day? What, we're supposed to fucking string you along for the next decade saying, oh, no, 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 no. Three more, four more, five more AOCs get into the house and we're going to force a vote on Medicaid. Nonsense. 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 So, you know, that's where I come down. You know, uh, Jordan is not the worst defender by any means. I don't have an axe to grind against him. You know, I think he means well and I think he's done a lot of great work. But um, um, it, you're, it, you're it would, it would be better for our view counts if we attack him, though. So, so <laughs> we should. Up, we should come up with something you have against him. All right. Well, you here. Go ahead. Think of something. Uh, he never wrote us back when we asked him to come on the show. That's true. That's true. All right. Fucking snob. <laughs> there you go. There Splitter. Go. Splitter. I invited him on the show. He said he didn't even, he just, he just uh, responded more info on the podcast. Question mark. I gave him more info. He never got back. So there you go. That's uh, a beef. We he didn't like what we wrote. He stood about. us up. He didn't like us. He didn't like. Our, I mean, at the time we didn't have, we didn't even have 200 subscribers. So I can't blame him too much. Yeah, fair enough. So, so we should we should come back to him. But now, you know, our like our like, um, you know, Heath Ledger Joker esque nihilism probably wouldn't appeal to him either. Um, <laughs> that which is what he's speaking out here against. Look, jo- Jordan in this article, um, you know, he's on he's on the left. He's for real. He gets he diagnoses the problem correctly. Um, he he doesn't prop up the squad in that article. He. He, he correctly identifies, hey, these people got into office and nobody really thought they were going to just wave a magic wand and we were going to get Medicare for all. But we expected them to make noise. We expected them to fight about it. We expected them to point out the hypocrisy. We expected them not to be corrupted by the system, which in the end, I, I get it. These are your co-workers and you're facing pressure. I think it starts the first time. Somebody sits you down and gives you the, you've got to go along to get along, not, not for your self-interest. That's not why you're doing this. You're not doing this so that they'll put you on magazine covers and take pictures of you in that fabulous dress at the Met. The reason you're doing this is because eventually you're going to hold the cards and you're going to do things differently. And the first time you accept that argument, you are lost. Right. I think that's what happened to all of them. Exactly. I don't think they sat down and said, shit, man, there's money to be made here. I think they some they got sat down by not just one person, various people saying, look, you got to be smart. I understand. Look, I, yes, I believe in Medicare for all, too, but you're never going to get it passed if you 
offend Nancy. So you have to make nice with her and then she'll make your priorities, her priorities. This is how change works. And it's so much easier to listen to that than it is to go and be constantly attacked by the media, be public enemy number one amongst the entire pseudo left establishment. It's easier to go along to get along and, and just say, say shit in interviews that you're not actually going to back up with the way that you vote in, right. in, or, in order to convince yourself that you still have some credibility on these issues. So Jordan, he doesn't elaborate on it quite like that, but he gets it and he, and he talks about it and what he says about Biden and what he says about Bernie, he gets all of it. Um, he's making I, what I think is a heartfelt plea that we have to keep fighting the good fight. I think where we might disagree with him is his vision of what the good fight is. We no longer feel that coming together with the Cenk Ugers and the Sam Cedars is a worthwhile political project because in the end, we're just holding our noses to no good purpose. You, you uh, at this point, there is no regular order democracy solution to this problem. You want to come to me when I was out on the street campaigning for AOC. You know what? There was a crazy looking dude who saw all this coming. I, I was you know, approaching everyone on the street, big dude with crazy white hair, denim jacket, big, big guy, six foot four. He's walking down the street. Hey, will you sign this uh, petition for, for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Talk to me when you're ready for a real revolution, motherfucker. Right. <laughs> he kept walking. You know what? He was right. He saw where this was going before she even got elected. Right. <laughs> and he wanted no part of it. He knew this wasn't going to work. This guy, this random guy on the street. Um. So with Jordan, I, I get it, man. He wants to believe, you know, it's like, it's like the, uh, it's like the person in the in the in the sports movie where everybody gives up. Come on, guys. He's trying to give that speech. Come on, guys. We might have lost yesterday, but you know what? <laughs> if we come together as a team, and nobody's buying it anymore for good reason, because as you just said, it's bullshit. Well, and also here's another place where the rubber really hits the road, right? The big agenda items that he's talking about, Medicare for all, Green New Deal, $30 minimum wage, right? $30. Yeah, $30 <laughs> minimum wage, right? <laughs> Those big items are abstractions, whether we like it or not. I wish to God that they weren't, obviously, obviously, but they are. Though There's no way those battles can be won in less than 20 years at this point. What battles that could be won, though, such as making the internet more accommodating to freedom of speech values, that is actually winnable. And here's right. the thing. The Cenk Ugers and the Sam Cedars are squarely on the wrong side of that. Right. So they might agree with us in theory about Medicare for all, and that's great. But that and, you know, <laughs> that and, and $8, you know, will get you, you know, whatever, a hamburger at McDonald's. That means nothing. That means nothing because those battles aren't winnable. The smaller right. battles that are winnable which have to do with civil, civil, I'm sorry, civil uh, libertarian values, First Amendment, surveillance state, anti-war values. I'm sorry, Cenk Uger, Sam Cedar, they're, they're not on the right side of those things. So are they our allies in any true sense? Not really, because on the fights that are actually winnable, they're in the way. They're not on the team. Right. If you're right. calling these fucking files drops, these Taibbi files and the Barry Weiss drops and the Elon Musk drops, if you're calling them a nothing burger— you're not an ally in any meaningful sense because that's a battle that's being fought right now, right? It's being fought by a very imperfect person <laughs> leading a very imperfect effort, but it's being fought. And if you're using half your airtime to shit on Elon Musk right now, um, and it's not that he doesn't deserve to be shit on, he certainly does, but if you think he is the greater evil than Jack Dorsey, then I'm sorry, you're not on the team. I, I'm not I'm not going to fight alongside you. For what? What for? What for? Because you theoretically agree with me on single-payer health care, on a battle that's not being won anytime soon anyway? What's the point? Right. Especially when the battles, as you say, that maybe we can get some traction because it's the they're not issues of the left. They're issues of the nation exactly. where you can, you can go to Rand Paul exactly. and get him to join together. 
right. with uh, our side uh, to pass legislation. And let's face it, the Republicans, the Republican red wave was delayed. It was not avoided. Right. It'll it was come not later. canceled out. Right. Yeah. It was not canceled. It was you, you had a you had a you had a combination of Roe and Trump saved the Democrats bacon for a minute. Right. But that's not going to be a long term result. So going back to the article I, I wrote years ago to uh, much uh, applause and derision. Uh, why don't we just try to reform the Republicans instead of the Democrats? That's going to be the only game in town pretty soon. So uh, civil libertarian kinds of issues. It's going to be about the only places where you can get any momentum. And frankly, if you don't have a free Internet, all the rest of this is not even at some point in the future. Exactly. Right. Right. At least you're going to have to need to, to be able right. to educate people about it exactly. and debate about it. And what it, amazingly, all these people on the so-called left that you're saying we should be reconciling with don't seem to get is they are opening the door to their own demise by advocating for the principle of censorship. Because unless you're living under a rock, it's not too hard to see that we're heading towards, at the very least, right wing governance. Right. And Perhaps also fascism. So once you have established a precedent of, well, you know, just say they violated the terms of service, you're the first people they're going to come for with that tactic. And you're exactly. not going to have any defense because you're the one who normalized it or amongst the people who normalized it. Well, you know who should know this more than anyone is Jordan Cheriton. And I wasn't going to bring right. this up, but now that right. you did, I will. His channel gets throttled more than any of them. This guy's got over 100,000 subs. And look at the view counts on his videos. They're like ours with 4,000 subs, 737 views, 1,000 views, 1 1.8 thousand views, right? I mean, the guy's numbers are not good because, you know, he's being either shadow banned or throttled, whatever. He's being right. fucked by yeah. the algorithm as yeah. much as anybody. Look, sure. two days, sure. one and a half, 1.1 thousand views. Right. 1.1, 1. Right. 1K. The right. guy's got yeah, 128,000 yeah. subs. It doesn't make any sense. We get those kinds of numbers. We have 4,000 subscribers. And our background set is a fucking college yearbook uh, photo. <laughs> and, a yearbook Boeing photo bookcase. Backdrop and a Boeing And a collapsing bookcase. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So he should know better, man. Nothing personal against Jordan, but I mean, come on. Get it together, right? And and get back to us, all right? Answer our fucking email too. That's one of the yeah, things. Yeah, answer our fucking email. I was out there with your fucking <laughs> cameraman at Grand Central Terminal. We're like we're like fucking family now. Exactly. It comes a Friday night, you never call. Come on. <laughs> all right, let's get to our uh, ten predictions for 2023. All right, so it is the new year. It is January first. We did our year in review 2022 show. Now we're gonna start out with 10 predictions for 2023. So, Russell, your first is a fairly easy one, or so we think. Anyway, uh, here we go. You're up. Ron DeSantis is going to run for president. My bolder prediction, which I've been making for, I don't know, okay, about a year now. About a year. I was, yeah, we'll I was, say that. I was, I was I'll, I'll, of, I'll give you that. I mean, it's probably more like this. six months, but we can round up in the spirit yeah, of the holidays. Yeah, we're going to round up in the spirit of the holidays. <laughs> uh DeSantis is going to be the next president. I'm going that far, but obviously that wouldn't be this year. So if right. we're talking about this year. He's going to announce that he's running for president. He's not. It's his time. It's his time. And he knows when you just wait on these things, you never know if it's going to be your time in four years. Right. right? That's yeah. why Obama the iron ran. is hot. He's got right. the momentum. Boom. He's going to go. Obama ran in 2008, knowing it was a long shot. Right. Yep. Knowing he yep. was going to run against the former first lady, senator of mm -hmm. New York. Right. She had all yep. the money, all the party. Right. But he's yep. like, you know what? In four years, I'm not going to be the hot new kid on the block. I got to do yep. it now. And he yep. did. And he won. Yep. DeSantis is coming out of being the only person to uh, come out of those midterms victorious on the Republican side. It's his time. This is his moment. And he's a smart guy. He knows that he's not going to let it go by. All right. Well, here's who else thinks it's his time. Here's my first prediction. Joe Biden is going to seek re-election, and my prediction is that he will announce uh, by April, um, and he might even announce to his inner circle, meaning, you know, not just his advisors, but, like, the actual, like, DNC, he might make it clear 
as early as a couple weeks from now. I think you will you will know for sure that he's running if by February other candidates have not entered the race. Because by this time, 2019, you already had a handful of Democrats saying they're running. And so if you don't see candidates announcing, uh, you know, within the next six to eight weeks, that means he's in. Now, he might announce then just to try and shove people out of his way, Mm -hmm. or he might just sort of send that message sort of internally. Uh, But either way, I think you're going to have a formal announcement that he is officially seeking reelection by April at the latest. So I think he's running and I think he will make that known pretty soon. And I think he will be the nominee. Uh, I don't think anybody has a chance to knock him out. As, okay, as I'm, I'm going to that sounds. I think that's true. I'm not saying well, I want well, that I, to be I, true, I don't I don't think any, anybody will really try who has the stature to have a chance at it because no. there, there's nobody with that stature who has that kind of independence. There, there, are, there are no more Bernie. Even Bernie Sanders is not Bernie Sanders anymore. No, and he's already said he wouldn't challenge Biden. There have been chirps that Marianne Williamson is thinking about challenging him. People have made videos about Again, that to get she a lot of clicks. She doesn't have the stature to, to have a shot. So no, nobody, so. nobody who would have a snowball's chance in hell is going to try to do it. I don't even uh, think she's going to try, really. I mean, I, I will believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when she announces that she's actually going to challenge it. I, 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 she yeah. definitely doesn't need that kind of grief from the corporate media. She, she doesn't need to get musked by those people. Right, uh, which, which is which exactly what they're going to do. They'll give her the Taibbi treatment. You know, yeah. now, now you're a dangerous kook. Ooh, yeah, right. right. Um, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna tack on a little sub prediction to your prediction related to my prediction, which goes back to why I've been so confident that DeSantis is going to be the next president. Joe Biden, his cognitive decline in this campaign is going to be so painful that even the corporate media cannot talk around it, really. It's going to be, he didn't really have to campaign last time. And when he did, before COVID got serious, he hardly appeared anywhere without it being an incident, without it being something his spokespeople had to deal with. Can you imagine what he's going to be like in a real campaign four years older? Right. So this is, my prediction is DeSantis knocks out Trump. Trump is much weaker than People realize now they're starting to realize at first they thought he was invincible. He wasn't invincible. He ran against Hillary Clinton. That's all it was. DeSantis knocks him out and then he's running against the Pepperidge Farm guy with Alzheimer's. Right. Boom. Yeah. Who who's going to vo- who's going to I mean, vote for that? Forget, over, the Biden record is over pretty awful. Right. No, he's not yeah. popular. He's not accomplished. And right. DeSantis right. reads like a competent manager, which after all of this, the chaos of Trump, the dementia of Biden, that's going to look very appealing to a lot of those suburban libs who voted for Biden against Trump. Right. All right, you're up. All right. Um, My prediction, you're seeing a lot of predictions of um, economic catastrophe next year, but that is as much a genre as attacking uh, left hosts on YouTube for clicks and cash. That, that's a whole thing. Like it, there, there, there are people who make a whole living out of constantly scaring the shit out of people about how they have to pull their money out of American banks tomorrow and buy gold. Right? Conservative sites particularly uh, feed off that trough. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go the other way. I believe inflation is going to pull back next year. Um. And the Fed has fucked a lot of very rich people this year, which is not their habit. It took inflation that serious for the Fed to show any independence from the endless greed of the upper classes who hold most of the financial assets. They're not going to keep on that course one second longer than they have to. They, they're getting a lot. They're getting an earful. It's hard. It's hard for Powell to go out to to dinner these days. I'm sure. Um, as soon as that inflation starts to pull back, Powell is going to reverse course. First, he's going to stop with the interest rate hikes. That in and of itself is going to shoot the stock market to the moon. Because lit- I've never seen this in my life, where the market it, it it is a bear market. I've just never seen a real one except for 2008. Um, where for an entire year, 
it's just over a year, really since like November 2021. That was when it started to tank. And it's been unrelenting, unrelenting. Like any bounce has been very shallow and then the selling has resumed. So you could definitely make the argument that a lot of these companies, like real companies, not the fly-by-night ones, companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google, you could definitely argue that the NVIDIA, that a lot of these tech companies have been way, way oversold. Um, as soon as Powell stops hiking interest rates, the stock market's going to go through the roof. He starts actually reversing his policy, which I think he probably will by the end of the year, as long as inflation uh, remains manageable. Um, it's it, Forget about it. I mean, this, the it, it, there are certain stocks that will go up more than 100% this year, if I'm right about that. Now, let me make something clear. I am not suggesting that there will not be a recession and job loss as a result of all these interest rate hikes. That's what's going to pull the inflation back. That was always the intention. As we saw during COVID, Wall Street and the real economy no longer have anything to do with each other. Once, once Powell starts to pull back on those interest rates or stop these hikes, all this cash that's sitting on the side, believe as much as these people lost in the market this year, they got plenty of money on the sidelines to throw in. They're all going to pile in to catch the bottom. And when they do, the market's going to go off the hook. You're also going to have all those Robin Hood people who got out now are going to run back in. They're also going to want to catch the bottom. So, ba so basically, as soon as he stops raising interest rates, you're going to have a speculative frenzy. And it's not going to matter if people have been thrown out of work and business is slow and consumer confidence is in the toilet. The stock market's still going to rock it. So my prediction would be recession next year and a booming stock market at the same time. All right. Well said. I'll take your word for it. I don't know nothing about no stock market. <laughs> my prediction is that SCOTUS is going to strike down Joe Biden's student debt cancellation executive order. Um, and I don't know. One thing I don't know is how exactly Biden will respond because – I think if he was going to challenge it, if he was going to change the justification for it, which would be under the um, – basically what he used was a COVID emergency sort of measure to try and justify student debt cancellation rather than just going through the um, the Higher Education Act. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um If he was going to try and redo his case, you'd think that – they would have just made that more sound argument in the first place, right? It seems like this was set up to fail, which means so, right. how does this? How does he handle it if this was set up to fail? Does he just take the loss and say, oh, you know, do a sort of, you know, Senate parliamentarian thing? Well, we tried. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, or does he just keep uh, extending the moratorium on payments? He can extend the moratorium on payments, but come 2024, he's, he's going to have to shit or get off the pot before people vote for either Biden or DeSantis, right? Um, he's going to have to take a final stance on that. He's not just going to be able to kick the can down the road indefinitely. My prediction is they're going to screw the students over because it seemed like it was a device used to gin up turnout, uh, to gin up turnout, pardon me, in a midterm where the Democrats don't have a Republican boogeyman on the ballot that is their own sort of turnout machine, right? I mean, a tool of the oligarchy is the two-party system. And a tool of the two-party system is negative, uh, negative, <clears throat> excuse me, God, maybe, the, maybe it is getting to me. Uh, <laughs> you got the brain fog? Right, yeah, no. Um, the negative partisanship, right? That's what it's called? Negative yes. partisanship or negative, yeah, yeah exactly. That is a function of the two-party system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, that props up the two-party systems, which props up this whole thing, right? And so when you have that, what you really have is uh, a situation where if there is no Republican boogeyman on the ballot, then you need something to drive that. With DeSantis or Trump, this odious figurehead at the top of the race, right? Um, at that point, you know— they already they, they they will have their turnout machine. 
they'll trust that the young people will turn out to stop DeSantis or to right, stop Trump. Right, right. So they can screw them as much as they want. Oh, abortion, right? right. Abortion. Right, right exactly. Yeah. Row, row, row. They'll row, have row, something row, else. Row. It'll be something right. else. Oh, yeah, student debt. Yeah, we tried. Couldn't get it. I mean, he, he can't really <laughs> restart student loan payments before uh, he's, he, the vote in November. He can't. He just can't. So he could try another tactic, possibly. I, he could do. He could actually try to do it the way he should have done it in the first place. Maybe. Just, right. just because he is going to be going into an election. Um, I don't I, think so, man. I think they're going to let it go. I think they're going to let it go. I think that's going to be hard, hard to do. How do you restart student? I, I, this is the Democrats. I'll grant you that. But how do you restart student loan payments going into an election year? Well, they're set to expire at the end of June, right? So if they, if they, if the moratorium expires, the way at the end we of June, do elections, that's going into an election. Year. Yeah, maybe you may be right. You may be right, but I just don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking they're going to have to take a final stance on this before november 2024 i th i think they're gonna have to come up with some other way to pussyfoot around canceling it mm, all right that i think they're they're gonna need to be dangling that going into the election all right well we will see we will see that's one that we'll have to hang in the air i suppose right yeah um all right you have your next prediction up here russia can't keep this going forever and the fact that you've had Putin kind of gingerly broaching the idea of talks suggests to me that he's looking for an exit ramp. Um, the West does not want an exit ramp. So my prediction is not based on Putin wanting it. He wants to get out of this already. War is good for business up to a point. After a while, it's just too destructive and disruptive to a lot of non-defense contract kinds of businesses to just keep a war going in the heart of Europe like this. Um, so I think the West is going to start to soften its stance about talks. They just cannot let a war go on in Europe like this forever. Um, I think the West is going to... Putin is going to be highly motivated and the West is going to start to feel like they they sucked as much blood out of out of this bloated carcass as they as they should without causing too much damage to other sources of profit and revenue. And as a result, you, you get a ceasefire sometime over the summer, if not a little bit before. Well, I mean, I certainly hope you are right about that. Um it's tough to say. I mean, look, one of the things I wrote a recent article about this, which is that, you know, this war, I mean, support for this war in America is entirely a function of PR, right? I mean, it's it's a marketing department thing. Sure. I mean, they're not they can't well, they, really they, they sell all the are. people. They all are, but this one especially Incubator because there's babies. not even the guise of national of national interest here, really. I mean, it, you can't even really sell people on the idea that there is an urgent national interest of ours in Ukraine. And so this is going to become an election issue also, don't forget. You know, it's one thing to be writing these checks, you know, signing all this money away when you don't have a Republican opponent sort of asking, hey, why? And the is opposition DeSantis to this war. Ask why, though? Well, I think he, I think he will. I actually do. My, yeah. my my hunch is that you know if he's smart, he will. Now, what you're saying, if what you're saying is true, it might be a moot. It might be you know a moot point. Um, certainly hope that that's the case. I couldn't really predict that either way, but certainly hope you're right. Speaking of DeSantis and Trump, I believe that the Republican civil war is going to flame out. Uh, I think McCarthy will find the votes to be Speaker of the House. He's struggling now. Um, but I think that the Republicans will, uh, over the course of this year, sort of find their footing. And I don't think that this, you know, coming apart of the GOP is actually going to happen because I think Trump's stock is plunging so quickly that now there was a new poll that came out that said a majority of Republican voters don't want him to run again. 
And so what that means is that, yeah, to the extent that one man's ego can tear down an entire party, there's always a chance. But, you know, what do we always say? Republicans want to win. They want to win. And what's uh, what's in their best interest is victory. And uh, I think they're going to do what is in their, uh, you know, what ultimately they feel uh, is in the interest of beating Joe Biden. And I think that they are going to find a way to do that. I think the leadership probably survives, right, um, just because I don't think they're going to want to make that a key focus this year, trying to tear down McConnell, right, tear down, you know, the top brass in the House, you know. So I don't think you're going to see the kind of, like, Tea Party um, momentum that we saw in 2009 where a lot of the top GOPers got torn down and taken away. Right. I think they're going to focus on trying to win back some of those normies who they lost in 2020 and then again in 2022. And so I think the civil war that's being hyped up is a little bit overblown. I think it might get nasty for a little while here, um, you know, as there is sort of uh, a sort of jockeying for sort of top spot in the Republican primary field heading into 2024. But I think the more consistently... uh, DeSantis sort of establishes himself, pardon me, as front runner. Um, I think you will see that sort of civil war fervor start to calm down. I, I I agree. I think DeSantis ultimately is their Glenn Youngkin uh, candidate, uh, a a less boring, more charismatic Glenn Youngkin who can actually be run for president. And I think at that time, I mean, this is kind of a sub prediction that I I was intimating when we were talking about the Stanford list. Woke culture has peaked. I I think once you have somebody who's not Donald Trump as the spokesperson for that side of the culture war, you're going to see very quickly how little support it really has. Once you have somebody who's not as odious as Donald Trump representing the other side. Yeah, I think that is very well put. All right, moving on. Oh, that's sad. Poor Mickey. Man, poor Mickey Mouse. Um, Well, and what I was just saying leads into this. Disney was really fucked in the 70s and 80s. People forget this now. There was a long period where Disney really couldn't figure out what it was and where it fit into the culture. The 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 post sixties culture just didn't fit with Mickey Mouse and Snow White, right? It just they they couldn't quite figure out what they were. So uh, they started Touchstone, which they had some success with, uh, starting to make films for adults. It was a big deal when they did that. It was very controversial for Disney to make any film with, like cursing in it or anything like that to come out of Disney Studios. Um, and um, Eisner really expanded the brand and changed it. And then under uh, Iger, who's just returned as CEO, um, they went on a buying spree. Instead of creating their own intellectual property as they did during this golden age you had under Eisner, where you had The Little Mermaid, where you had Beauty and the Beast, where you had this new wave of animated classics to match the old ones that had been done under Walt Disney, uh, you know, Dumbo and Snow White. You had this, like, Disney's animation during this period mostly was just re-releases of their old stuff. I mean, the 70s and 80s. And then the 90s, there's a, a, and late 80s, there's this whole new wave of Disney classics, what we now consider classics. Lion King, all all of these films. Um, But then they stopped creating their own popular IPs in favor of buying everybody else's. So they went, they bought Marvel, they went and bought uh, Lucasfilm, and they've leaned very heavily into that content. At the same time, the company seems to have been overrun by social justice warriors who don't really have any particular artistic talent. And for some inexplicable reason, they've been put in charge of a lot of banner projects at Walt Disney. Um, this has gradually been eroding the brand image and it's been eroding its brand loyalty. Now, if you look at the numbers that have resulted from that, 
they're pretty disastrous. Disney is spending $2 for every dollar in revenue that it's taking in on Disney Plus on its streaming service. Um, their theme parks, and, th and this, is, this is an Iger, this is Iger's fault. Um, they got really greedy. It used to cost $125 to go to the park. Now you have to pay that for each individual park to visit uh, to visit Disney World. Uh, so there are five parks you have to you have, yeah yeah you have to pay again for each one a la carte yeah yeah you have to pay a la carte it didn't used to be that way that that's really just ripping off the parents uh, really really going overboard and they're making content that really is not uh, family friendly in the interest of politics now I'm not I'm not taking a moral stand on some of these uh, issues but Strange World really illustrated it. Um, they really touted in the marketing that it's a breakthrough in representation because it's a family and one of the, the son, the teenage son is gay. I, I don't have an issue with that, but from a business perspective, that was a very bad idea. And this is winding up losing, um, it's going to be one of the biggest bombs in animated in animation history. Um, look there are a lot of parents who don't want to take their five-year-old to a, to a movie that has that element in it. Even if they don't necessarily consider themselves anti-gay or homophobic, they might not want to have that discussion with their five-year-old. Right? And there are a lot of people like that. Um, taking on Ron DeSantis on the, you know, so-called don't say gay bill, which we covered a while back, that bill is actually very popular. And, its overall thrust is you can't discuss sex, sexuality, and gender with children from nursery school through, I think it's third grade. If you think you live in a country where that's not a popular position and you're basing the way that you're writing entertainment for children and families on the assumption that you live in that country, it's not surprising that Disney is struggling now, that all of its content is struggling. And now it's not... We talked a little bit about this offline, and we'll get into it more probably in the film club. Um, I watched Maverick last night, which was the big hit of the year, right? Which a lot of people are pointing to that and saying, look, people will still go to the movies. They just don't like this shit that you're cranking out. It's not that it, Maverick was diverse. One of the prominent characters was a female pilot. That's one of the, the why well, I don't want to spoil it, but, you know, she was a very prominent character in it. And. But she never gave a speech about how men catcall her on the street. Right, right, right. There's the thing. It's not that you can't have these themes. We've had these themes for a very long time. I'll give you a good example within the sci-fi fantasy genre. Battlestar Galactica, I don't know, this is maybe 15 years ago now, took the whole bad boy pilot thing and gender switched it. Had a female character who was that character, who was the Tom Cruise Maverick character, who was the badass pilot right down to the sleeping around. But you know what? It was just built into the story. It was part of the story. They never gave a speech. The feminism was built in. It was built into casting it that way. But they didn't use that as a substitute for quality writing, acting, and directing. They didn't expect the audience to fall all over themselves to praise it simply because of that element. Right. They understood it had to be good. Right, of course. Yeah. And that those themes the that problem. are worked in are subtext. That's where it's that's subtext. when storytelling works, is when it's subtext, not that's when it's it. text. Yeah. Well, and that's how you persuade people. That's how you don't get any backlash against your message. When you've told the story so well, people right, love the character. It. Right, exactly. Right? And they're not going to attack it. And right. the same exact kind of dorks who went crazy about She-Hulk, I promise you, to a person, they love Battlestar Galactica. To a person. You won't find one of those people who does not love Battlestar Galactica. So my thesis, and Disney is at, Disney, I've watched it over the years, It very its stock never goes below the low 80s. That's like the bottom for Disney stock. The stock has been sitting there and it hasn't really been able to get off it for a really long time, like it hasn't rebounded. I think Disney is in a similar position to where it was in the 70s and 80s. They fucked up Star Wars, they fucked up Marvel, and they can't easily manage that financially because they put so many of their eggs in those two baskets. 
Their animation department has been overrun by whack jobs so that they're not able to make anything that's not some kind of a some kind of a cultural statement that parents really aren't interested in bringing their children to. I think it's going to be a long, cold winter for Disney. And I think this is going to be the year that it really enters a new phase of it's like an overextended empire. That empire is about to collapse. I see Disney stock going into the 50s, maybe the 40s. All right. Well, coming down the home stretch here, one of my final predictions here um, is that the House investigations are mostly a flop. Now, don't mistake that for me saying that they will not uncover anything of substance when they investigate Hunter Biden or Fauci um, or any of the big tech stuff that they are uh, sort of hinting that they are going to look into. I just think the country is so polarized right now. Um, that it's not going to move polls that much. Um, because when Russell, when you talked about when in your uh, in inflation um, pick there, you mentioned how there is this real disconnect between the stock market and the uh, e- economy. <clears throat> Pardon me. I should not have picked the day when the plague to hit my house to only have <laughs> one 12 ounce can of <laughs> seltzer. You really should, have your, should have made yourself a hot toddy. I should now. have made a hot toddy tea or at least a I, big I, juggle. Those, those fucking really things are magic. Yeah. Hot toddies are magic. The Irish know their shit, man. Yeah, no, that's well, true. That's hot, true. Hot whiskey with some cloves, mm, a little yeah, cinnamon. Delicious. Um, but, but yeah, just as they're, the, just as the stock market doesn't signal how the everyday person is doing, I think the sort of electoral outcomes that we're seeing now do not signal the general mood of the country because I think so many people have fallen victim to despair, right? And they have just sort of thrown their hands up and said, fuck this, right? And so in that sense, I do think, yeah, they're going to make some findings there. They will be important in that way. Will they move polls? No. I think it's a, you know, we had a status quo year in 2022. I think 2023 is going to be another status quo year. That's not a hell of a pitch for the podcast. Hey, this is going to be a really boring, (laughs) depressing year politically, everybody. Make sure you tune in every three days to hear what we have to say about it, right? But, uh, you know. That's why we're doing the film club. They're exactly right. That's why we started the movie club. <laughs> right? So I have something else to talk about. Um, but that's that's what I think. I think they will make some noise. It'll make the rounds in certain media circles, Fox News, obviously, and online, right? People will talk about it online. Will that manifest itself in electoral outcomes in the off-year races in November? I doubt it. I doubt it. I think the normies have really sort of monopolized that space, you know, um, and sort of really taken it for them and their kind you know um I, I don't see there being a revolution at the ballot box in november based on anything that the house looks into over the you know late winter spring and summer well that's the thing i it, it's the same thing that happened with january 6th you, you only convince the convinced right exactly right exactly that's a really good way to put it yeah exactly absolutely um all righty so let's uh do it we got one more Per person here, your final prediction here, Twitter survives. Tesla, however, ends up being the venture that uh, becomes a thorn in the side of Elon Musk. It, well, it's already happening. Um, yeah. He can't really walk away from Twitter. He owes billions of dollars on it. And I also think it's such a vanity project for him. I just don't think he'll concede defeat. He enjoys the cultural power this gives him too much. I don't, I, it might make business sense. There's a, there's a saying in the investment world, it's never too late to walk away from a bad investment. Um, Twitter is probably a bad investment. And on that basis, he should probably walk away from it. I don't think he will, at least not this year, but I don't know if he thought really thought through who his customers are and that if he, if if the corporate media turned him into Donald Trump, which it has, this morning on my newsfeed, I'm I'm reading an article where a cultural historian is talking about narcissistic men and the role they play in our culture and 
Donald Trump and Elon Musk and Sam Bankman Freed, not really looking at the fact that those are three very different personalities, actually. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Actually. But no, no, there are enemies. They're all Nazis. They're all, that's, that's the level of subtlety of this uh, cultural historian. You can wipe your ass with wherever she got that fucking degree. Um, the libs buy Teslas. And, yeah, of course. And, you know, at first when he took over Twitter, my first thought was, huh, if there's anything that could get Republicans to buy Teslas, it's going to be this. But Ford's, Ford already owns their asses. GM already owns their asses. They're, they're not Teslas. That, that would be like try, that would be like if if Nancy Pelosi suddenly became conservative, you still couldn't get them to vote for Nancy Pelosi. It's the brand is just too tarnished. Well, the other part of it is, you know, you mentioned this in the in the past, you know, and this this perhaps applies to more of the, the sort of super rich than the rank and file shit lib. But like for a guy like Rob Reiner, right, it's a lot easier to trade in his car for another car. If you if you want a virtue signal with what car you drive, you trade in one EV for a Ford right. EV, right? right? That's it. You can't That's trade it. in. 10 million followers or however many followers he has right right you can't take that to mastodon that's twitter exclusive man and right. so right. to give that up would cost something and as you mentioned right. in the past you actually put it very well these people are into cost free virtue signaling not just virtue signaling virtue signaling that costs them nothing right what's a that's Tesla why they're all Rob still Reiner? on twitter he trades it in for another one right exactly that's why they're all still there yeah, no, they're all they're all getting all the Hollywood celebrities. They're all getting rid of their Teslas now, right? Um, and that is going to kill Tesla because as they go, so goes their customer base. The people right. who take Rob Reiner seriously are the customers for Tesla. Exactly. And and he's yes, EVs are the future, but Ford has such a head start with that market, with the Fox market that's going to start buying EVs, they're not going to buy a Tesla. They're going to buy the brand that they trust. If they're already going to get a, a, a non-gas powered vehicle, it's going to be a Ford or a GM. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. One more here. This is my prediction. And I hinted at this when we did the Jordan Sheraton segment, where as what I, what I said in that segment, cause we're going to clip these separately. So in case anybody's watching one and not the other, um, as progressive goals become more abstract, the only tangible winnable battles become the civil libertarian fights, right? Speech, bodily autonomy, things like that. Um, and for that reason, I am predicting maybe not a massive yellow wave, but a certain yellow wave. I am predicting that libertarianism has a big year. I think it makes a resurgence. I think people are going to think a lot more highly of this at the end of this year than they do now for precisely the reasons I got into in our last segment, but I'll say them here once more. If you're on the left, right, and I'm not saying everybody on the left becomes a libertarian thinker. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is the battles that are actual, actually being fought now that are actually winnable now, like free speech online— Right. And like I said, they're being fought in a very imperfect way by very imperfect people. But those are actually battles that are happening where there is significant momentum towards making the Internet a freer space. I'm not just talking about Elon Musk. I'm talking about spaces like Rumble. Right. Substack. Right. A free speech thing, which we are obviously on as well. Um, those are examples of fights that can you, you can actually right. win as opposed to Medicare for all. So it's not that like progressives are becoming less progressive. It's just that those goals are not winnable anymore. So you got to go where the fight is. And I think people are going to, like I said, give the sort of libertarian ideology a second look. Not that they will subscribe to it outright, but I think a lot more people are going to be have a favorable view. If you took like a very sort of like standard, like, you know, Harvard University poll. Right. What are your attitudes towards socialism, communism, libertarianism, right. conservatism? Right. I think the libertarian bounce is going to be noticeable at the end of the year. 
partly for the reasons I just said, but it's not just left-wing people. I think a lot of establishment narratives are just crumbling. I think faith in institutions will continue to crumble. Like I said, there is that gap between that kind of attitude, between a collapsing society and a stabilizing electoral process. There is that sort of disconnect where the, the, the reality on the ground is not necessarily going to reflect itself in the composition on not just uh, Capitol Hill, but state houses, right? All these things. Um, I think there's going to be a real sort of gap there, but I think a lot more people um, are just going to become a lot more distrustful of institutions, of the quote-unquote administrative state, right? That's the whole thing. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a big year for the, uh, what's his name here, the Gadsden flag uh, <laughs> You know, you may, I think those, those I think the, the, those flag sales might get a, a bounce by the end of the year. <laughs> I, I I agree for all the reasons you're saying. One, these are people are increasingly going to see these as the only winnable battles, um, and also the more odious the government becomes, the more sympathetic to a libertarian argument of keeping your money and applying it the way that you want the more appeal that's going to have to a broader political spectrum. Right, exactly. Once you decide the government can't do Medicare for all, well, maybe we need to pay less taxes and start insurance co-ops. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Um, and, you know, I mean, that even manifests itself in a certain labor movement, right? Not that, you know, obviously, you know, we think of the labor movement as the home of sort of, I won't even say socialism in this country, but it's a left thing. Really, you know, extracting money, extracting capital from capital, extracting wages from management, um, that's not necessarily a person versus state endeavor, right? I mean, you know, that doesn't necessarily contradict any of the tenets of civil uh, libertarianism. Um, well, that, it, it, it is just, it is workers, you know, taking the reins themselves, taking the battle directly to the boss. That's, uh -huh. that's really what I mean is that you're not involving the state in that process, right? So what if AOC doesn't show up? Who cares? They could win right. <laughs> as Chris Smalls proved, they could win anyway. That that's what <laughs> I found intellectually <laughs> inconsistent about Ayn Rand's philosophy we of right, course on, right, of course exactly. on the left she's the uh she's the great evil but right. hey she had some interesting and valid ideas about money and wealth and ingenuity and its relation to wealth generation and a capitalist society um i i think she was missing a lot but where her whole thing fell apart where i felt she had no credibility when I read her work, because there's a lot of people, if you read Ayn Rand when you're young, you're reading it and you're like, shit, this makes a lot of sense. Where it all fell apart for me was the way that she portrayed unions and union organizers. You spend all of this time, and I'm talking specifically about Atlas Shrugged, you spend all this time arguing that the way capitalism should work is a raw battle of people fighting to get the most capital they can for what they have to contribute. Right, exactly. So isn't that by definition what a union does? Exactly. Why well, is it I mean. heroic it's not a when this capitalism, individualist really. inventor right. does it, Right. but they're thieves when the unions do it? Right. That's a woman who was traumatized by communism. You see that a lot <laughs> yes. with the most extreme yeah. anti-socialist people <clears throat> very often they're escapees from communist countries who just can't distinguish between socialized medicine and the gulag they just to, to them as soon as you're not paying for the doctor that's it right stalin yeah, exactly, is right. coming for you right yeah exactly exactly and like and I'm, I'm actually i'm very happy that you mentioned that because i don't want people to get the impression that we are going to turn libertarian right <laughs> we're, we're not but i'm just saying it's a matter of prioritizing where you can find wins and where you can't right. because the vision that's being expressed now by mainstream figures really in both parties especially the democrats though is that there are no there are no discussions to be had right 
there is there are no possibilities. There are no new frontiers to explore. They have really truly become. I've called them this in the past. The end of history party. Well, this is it. This is it. That's really what Obama was, right? We've elected a biracial, neoliberal scumbag who's going to serve the banks, but who is going to give off the impression that because he could rise to the presidency, anything is possible. And there you have it. There you have it. Progress ends there. Oh, that wasn't good. Oh, no. Donald Trump. Oh, boy. Yeah. Who do we put in? <laughs> Racists. Right? Right. Joe Biden. Right, they'll every president who, now will be done, in the mold who's of him. done more to, more to hurt people of color, arguably, than any living politician. Right, but I mean, what 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 Biden really sim- well, yes, obviously, but he really is the perfect successor in this sort of timeline of Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden, because Biden is just okay. Now we're just going to flatline. We're just going to yeah. ride this yeah. straight as long as as it will go, and that's really we'll, what they we'll, have in mind. We'll see your racist. And we'll raise you our own racist. Right, exactly. And there's just a lack of curiosity at, at the heart of it all, right? I mean, that's the thing that's really depressing about modern libs and modern Democrats is just there is not a desire to explore the possibilities of the world, right? To explore, That's why they don't value speech. That's why they don't care about free speech because they have nothing to talk about. Right. Right. right, they have nothing to offer to the conversation. Even if this is all an abstraction, and we're all just jerking off on YouTube, watching people talk shit about stuff that's never going to happen, wouldn't you rather do that than not? Right? Isn't it just? Doesn't it just sort of tickle your brain the right way to have these conversations, even if that's all they are? But they don't even want to have these conversations. They don't want to think about it. They want to shut these conversations down, and people are going to reject that. People are more curious than that. Right. They are not in the majority in that way. They may be the majority of the voting public, but that's why I'm saying look for look for maybe a small one, maybe not a seismic one, but look for a yellow wave in 2023. All right. That's our show, is it not? I believe so. All righty. Well, thank you, guys. That's a show. And actually, we're going to start a new tradition now that we've done this for the first time. We're going to pull these out at the end of the year and see how we did. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So our year-end show, we will see how these stack up. We want to thank our patrons. Go to patreon.com front slash do dissidents to support the show. You can also go to do dissidents.substack.com. We will see you in the chat when this video airs. I'm hoping I can get it to premiere. By this point, it'll have to be probably 730. I don't know if it'll happen on time for seven, but it will be premiering this evening. And look for the clips on YouTube and on Rumble and on Facebook twitter substack follow us everywhere thank you guys very much this was a lot of fun this was a pretty good uh, first show of the year i think i think this went pretty well yeah tight i'm in desperate need of cough drops and water but uh it went, <laughs> went pretty well thank you guys very much uh we will see you thursday be safe be well bye bye till then thanks again please clap